All right, this is a cool one today. Michael Collins from Nova Masters swim team, mate. How you doing? I'm doing great, man. Good to talk with you. I see you on yeah. the deck a little bit since you live in the same city. Yeah, yeah. I moved out to Irvine almost 12 months ago now. I'm loving it. Uh, not not sure about the June gloom. When's that going to clear up for us? I don't know. We tend to get that almost year round. You know, like like you talked about the other day, I think on one of yours, you know, it's like that 405 freeway. It kind of stays overcast and you get on the other side of it and it burns off. So, yeah. yeah. But it makes well, listen, it. Man, we, got some, um, we got some exciting stuff to talk about today. You and I are kind of getting together on a project, hey? Yeah, I'm representing. I got your shirt on today. I think mm -hmm. mine might have a little bit more cat hair on it. But uh, yeah, there's a. Uh, I'm, you know, masters is my thing, master swimming, although I do a little bit of stuff with kids as well. Yeah. But uh, there's a, a national uh, swim league now called Grown Up Swimming, and mm -hmm. they've got little leagues all around the country, and they're just starting a league here in Orange County, uh, and it's all 25s and 50s. So it's, you know, run like a summer league format of just short stuff and some relays. And, uh, when I heard about that, man, your name just popped right into my head. I said, man, I got to get Brett on board with this mm -hmm. and uh, kind of apply some of the things from, you know, today's swimming into uh, into Masters. Yeah. Yeah. And it's exciting, man. I'm gonna, we're going to have our first uh, Sprint Revolution swim team. It's going to be for Master Swimmers. What a way to start. You know, it's pretty cool. I'm excited. Yeah, it should be really neat. It's, you know, it's – uh. There's been so much change in the last, you know, 20 to 30 to 40 years in, in training methods and what people do to go fast. And, you know, it, there's a trickle down of what, it, what that leads to, to what age groupers do or masters or whatever. And I've for years been trying to apply the concepts of what world-class swimmers do with master swimmers. And you can't just copy exactly the same sets and all that stuff it's got to be scaled to their ability level but you can still learn from the principles of you know like underwater as an example you know 30 40 years ago people weren't doing multiple dolphin kicks underwater right. but it is teachable and learnable and applicable as you get older and now you know you'll see people in their 60s at nationals able to underwater dolphin kick they're not going right. 15 meters but they're still doing it so there is yeah application across so uh that's why i was pretty interested in you know getting more into the sprint revolution stuff and trying to take some of the ideas that you're promoting or teaching and applying it to masters yeah yeah and, and i appreciate that it's you you've always been one of these guys that asks a lot of questions but is very you know just inquisitive in terms of your own growth and and the way that you run your master's programs T t tell us about your master's program that you've been running, how long it's been going, how many how many um, athletes come, how how often do they come, that sort of thing. Just give us a breakdown of just a usual master's practice. The thing I love about you, like I said, is that you incorporate uh, modern day ideas into coaching these master's athletes. It's the best run master's program I've ever seen. You know, Thanks, uh, and I travel the world, mate. So you do a fantastic job of really engaging the the master swimmers who come we and we talk about masters as anyone that's really you know swam swam in college they may have just left the sport you know they might be 22 23 24 years old all the way up to you know as old as you want to be really you know and and they come along and you pack the house mate and the reason why you pack the house is because you keep it engaging you keep it fresh and you incorporate skills that and and you're engaged in the workout too Exactly. A lot of, a lot of uh, masters coaches will just get up there and put something on the board and sit down. You're you're not like that. You're coaching these athletes from any age to get better. So yeah, tell us about your program. So uh, I've been at Nova here in Irvine in Southern California since uh, 2000, just after the Olympic, after the Olympics in Sydney. Uh, I started up here. I got interviewed by Dave Salo, who was running the Nova Age Group program, and they said they needed a new masters coach. And uh, man, I came and saw the facility and everything, and it it, it wasn't as nice as it is now. We, we had a 50 meter pool and then a smaller dive pool, but they they expanded it. And so I've been coaching in you know one of the greatest places there is. We got two 50 meter pools and another 
training pool and they, they might be adding a third in the next few mm. years, which would be pretty awesome. But we have, you know, around 400 master swimmers total, you know, registered for the year in a given month. It's more like 250 to 300 registered, you know, they're paying dues mm. and they got several options of times to come through the day from early in the morning to mid morning to middle of the day. And we don't get too many night workouts right now because the kids kind of have priority over pool space. And I'm kind of OK with that, too, because I did many years of the bookends of coaching at, you know, 530 in the morning and then coaching all the way to eight or nine at night. And that gets pretty rough. So yeah. uh, we're mostly morning and midday and we run practices that are an hour to an hour and 15 minute long. And we kind of have different themes through the week. And my you know, group is a pretty variable group from 18 to 80 plus and people that are new to swimming that can barely finish at 25 to, you know, Olympians that still swim mm -hmm. with that thumb. So uh, I kind of feel like a master's coach has to have the broadest bandwidth of ability of, to coach everybody at the full spectrum. And I do get really engaged and take it seriously. It's not just to me, masters isn't just, you know, we're just floating around and it's yeah. leftovers. It's like, I kind of have this silly saying that masters are eight and unders with credit cards that are allowed to drink. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I kind of treat them a little bit like eight and under sometime of like keeping them on task to do things right, to get their times and, and all this. And, uh, I think that that's why they come, you know, if they want to just float around, they can go to lap swim. Yeah. And to me, lap swimming is super boring. I have to do it on my own sometimes because I don't always get to train with our group because I'm on the deck, but lap swimming just goes by so slowly. So mm -hmm. when you've got an assignment of something to do that's within your capability, you know, time goes by and you have a sense of accomplishment. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we range from, you know, triathletes to competitive pool swimmers that do want to do well in the 50 and the 100 and short stuff and all that to just general fitness. So it's quite a challenge to make sets that meet all those needs. So a lot of sets I'll give might have the same set and parameters in terms of, let's just say, 2100s, but a distance swimmer may be doing those all best average and a middle mm -hmm. distance swimmer might be doing three fast ones, you know, at pace and one easy one. And a sprinter might just be float, 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 bam, and just going full gas every fourth or something like that so that I can, you know, feel like everybody got something out of it and they weren't forced to do distance when they're a sprinter or vice versa because they're not getting there every day. They're coming around three times a week. So you got to kind of make the most out of each session. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, it's the best run master's program i've ever seen most engaging and i love it i i join from time to time when i've got a chance to get in there because i'm the same i hate that swimming on my own you know that lap swimming it's just not the same when you've got a group of people kind of in there and all working hard together even if it's just for 45 minutes an hour you feel like you get so much more out of it so yeah um i know you had some some questions for me in regards to maybe how some of this new age you know swimming is this kind of sprint revolution type work can apply to master swimmers. So like uh, run me through some of the questions you might have for me. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's uh, you're such a, a good resource of, of sprint stuff, but you know, when people hear this, it's often hard to apply it to their swimming life, you know, and, and you interview all these amazing elite level swimmers, but there's a lot of coaches out there that don't coach the highest level of elite swimmers and still need to be using some of these ideas, but how do we incorporate it into our own programs? And, you know, I just looked at swimming over the years and, and I study the results and things like that. And the thing that's gotten to me uh, that just kind of has blown my mind over time is I'll look at like NC two A's mm. uh, division one men or women, men, for example, and look at like the 200 freestyle relay and see that several years ago, uh, it's almost all, it was almost all 19s, a couple of 20 points, a couple of 18s. And then it, it starts shifting down. And then I start seeing there's only a few 19s. It's almost all 18s and there's some 17s, you know? And now it's like, there's 20 programs with four guys plus that can go, 18 seconds in a 50 or faster. And right. it's just like, 
wow, that is like, it was so mind boggling that anybody could go in 19 and 18. And now it's like, it's a dime a dozen to do it. Mm. And so these programs are definitely doing stuff that's helping multiple athletes go that fast, you know, all the time regularly. Yeah. Uh, and it's got to be, you know, it's not because they're training harder because the 70s and 80s, man, they were training hard and doing a lot of stuff. It's got to be from the specialty work. And, and I know everybody does some strength training, but it seems to me that a lot of this has come from in water strength development with technique, you know, to be able to mm -hmm. put down the power in the water force that's resulting in moving forward, going fast and speed and stuff. So those are kind of the things I'm interested in and learning more about is what are a few examples of things that you think that college teams do now that they weren't doing five or 10 years ago that's helping them swim this fast? Yeah. And, and your assessment is right. You know, a lot, of, a lot of the things you said there are spot on. And, you know, I think about this stuff too all the time, obviously. And I've, I've put together over the past 12 months a lot of my own ideas and thoughts on this and kind of put it out on my website to say, like, look, here's, here's where we're headed. Here's where it's going. Here's where we're making advancements. These are the reasons why. Um, you know, it's interesting you say the word. We, a lot of people associate um, harder with more, you know, more distance. The, the longer we swim, the harder it is, which is, to me, is is not completely accurate you know as, as a sprinter and someone that likes to go fast it's very very hard to go fast you know and so like you said when you design your workouts your your distance swimmers might be going 2100s whole pace but your sprinters might be going you know three off one on because it's hard you can't sprint every single repeat right so when we talk about harder it's not so much the harder that I'm, you know, like it's hard to do sprinting and it's, and it's very difficult, but we have to be smart, you know, and I think that's where we've got, we've got smarter with sprinting. We, we understand it more now. We understand that it is extremely difficult and you can't just back up repeat after repeat going fast. It's going to, it's going to break you down. You're not going to be able to hold the pace that you need to pay hold. Um, we're, we're much more intelligent these days with, um, top end speed, for instance, right? I'm going to break down the different types of speed. You've got top end speed. Top end speed is that seven to eight seconds of pure speed that you can hold at full full pace, right? Like we can't hold full pace speed for for long distances. You know, it's just impossible. The body creates this uh, ATP and, and and we burn it up, and then we go into the the lactate system, and then all of a sudden you're producing lactate. In, and the body's responding to that, you just can't go fast for, for a very long period of time. So eight seconds is about that top end speed where you can go from zero to 100 as fast as you possibly can and, and maintain that speed. Now it starts to break down after about eight seconds. So we go into kind of this um, front end speed that we talk about. And front end speed might be the first 50 of your 100 where you're kind of going out and you're holding a, a speed that is is strong and powerful, but it's comfortable, it's manageable, it's something that you can maintain for a longer period, you know. So we we talk about the front end of our of our races. It might be the front end of your hundred, it might be the front end of your two hundred if you're if you're swimming at two hundred. So it's it's that easy speed that you can go out with. And then you have that that back end speed. You know, what what's that closing speed? How are you gonna come home? You're gonna turn, you're gonna come home, you gotta finish the race off, you gotta be strong and powerful in that instance. You want to swim over the top of people. That's that's kind of the back end of the race. So it might be the back end of your 100, might be the back end of your 200. So there are different types of speeds, different types of paces, and we have to train these. So um, the understanding of that is is something that's a lot more pr prevalent these days. Um, the sharing of information, Mike, you know, like in terms of my podcast and other platforms that put information out there. And that's why you said, you know, we've got 20 programs now that you can go to anywhere in the country and guys are swimming 18 seconds because we're sharing this information we're, and we're, we're understanding it more. Um, there, there's two main things, Mike, that I believe has really taken us into the future of sprinting. And that is the understanding of pace and resistance work in the pool, right? Speed work, sp speed pace and resistance work is, is crucial. And then the, the second thing is the advancements in recovery and our understanding of recovery. 
All right. You know, like you said, back when you probably started this master swimming thing back in early 2000s, we didn't really do recovery sessions. You know, it was, there was no such thing as recovery really back then. It was how hard can you work for as long as you can work and then you break down and you maybe have the weekend off or you, you get sick or you get injured or something like that. It's just we work, 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 work until we break ourselves down and then we recover. Well, we're, we're, we're way beyond that now. And so there are there are many things that we can do in terms of um, increasing our, our speed through resistance. And I'll talk to you about specific things like that. And then I'll talk to you very specifically about the, the things that we're doing recovery wise that have really um, helped us in the advancement of sprinting over the past, you know, 20, 25 years. Yeah, and that's, I am definitely interested in getting a little bit into the weeds of uh, some of these things that are done. Yeah. Uh, what would you define as a, it's still kind of more general picture, but what are the benefits and purposes of the in-water resistance training? Yeah, um, su super simple, right? Like, first of all, you're going to increase strength, right? Like your, your muscular strength, if you get stronger in the water, it's only going to help you, right? And this is where you'll see a lot of athletes these days, a lot of sprinters, female sprinters, they look very strong. Male sprinters are very strong. Um, masters athletes are getting fitter and stronger than ever before. They look they look like uh, Olympic athletes, some of these masters swimmers. You know, you get there to the pool and you think to yourself, wow, you've got like 6% body fat, you've got muscles, you look strong, you look powerful. So they're, they're, they're swimming faster through strength. And and the resistance training helps us gain muscular strength. Okay, so that's number one. Number two is, you know, one of the things we overlook here in, in doing some of this resistance training is it's going to improve your endurance, right? The longer that you can endure under a stress, the better your endurance capabilities are going to be. So improving your stamina from resistance type work um, and then adding in longer swims in terms of, recovery between sprints as well is only going to help your aerobic conditioning so you know the way i look at it is you do your your speed which is going to improve your endurance because you're under stress and then you add that aerobic conditioning as recovery on the side of that so when you couple it together we're still getting everything we need but we're improving strength and endurance um, the next thing is you know you're going to improve your speed and your power you, you only improve speed by going fast, Mike. You know, like you, you can't swim fast by swimming slow often. You've got to swim fast often. So improving your speed, number one, by, by swimming faster in practice and then improving your, your power, okay, through resistance training. Again, you get your strength and you improve your strength and your speed, then you improve your power, okay? That's how you get more powerful. Your connection on the water. When you're, when you're pulling a parachute, let's say, Mike, you're, you've got to get your hand and elbows and, and fingers in the right position to be able to hold water to move forward when you're pulling a parachute. So you've got to get yourself in, in technical positions where you can actually hold more water. So that's how you improve your power. Um, you're going to improve your body composition, right? When you're swimming fast and you're burning up calories, you're going to improve your uh, body composition. So you're going to lose uh, fat. You're going to increase lean muscle. Um, that's that's another advantage of swimming fast in practice. Um, your your bone health, right? Like as we get older, we talk about um, bone health for master swimmers, right? Like when you've got weight bearing exercises, that improves your bone density. So you're going to improve your your bone health as you get older as well. So sprinting and resistance training is is really vital for that. Um, you're going to improve your recovery capabilities right when you strengthen your muscles through resistance training you improve your recovery time between sets because you're stronger you've improved your endurance you're getting technically better um, so your recovery time is actually going to improve from your improved fitness as well um, there's there's so many benefits to this right like your your functional fitness right you're going to be able to you know, a lot of people will couple resistance training outside of the pool with a little bit of resistance training, uh, I mean, inside the pool with outside the pool as well. So they'll do a couple of resistance trainings so that functional fitness is going to improve 
your quality of life as well. You're going to get stronger. You're going to get fit. You're going to, um, you know, just have a better outlook on life because you're coming in and you're feeling strong and you're feeling fit. So you, it's going to improve your mental health as well. So Mike, the, in terms of resistance training and speed training, I could go on and on in terms of the benefits, right? Like there's just so many benefits to it. And I can argue those till I'm blue in the face because I'm, I'm living proof of it. You, you are too. Look how fit you are as, as a man and a, you know, an older man like myself, like we're both in pretty good shape because we do this type of work too, you know? Yeah. It, it really is important to have that intensity level. It's something that's a big challenge for me as a master's coach. And I see this across the board is with the high level swimmers, they're very efficient. And so they can go through a workout and hardly do any work because they're so efficient. Uh, and so you're looking for these ways to make it harder to, mm. to progress to, because they're so, you know, they can swim at 10 second, 25, and it's not even that hard for them. You put a cord on them, it's a whole different ball game and they've got to keep that body tension firm and straight with master swimmers. A lot of them are highly inefficient to begin with. And so we're just trying to teach them to be efficient. But eventually, the better ones, they do get to that level. And once you reach your level of efficiency, you have to look for those increases of resistance to challenge your body. And we need a certain amount of body tension to swim mm -hmm. with to keep the form there. Mm -hmm. And in, in the groups I see, we see a lot of bleeding of energy. The energy is coming out, but it's not focused, right? It's going everywhere because the body's wiggly and all this stuff. And that's where I find the the resistance equipment in the water, like, like, a like pulling a parachute or using a cable or yeah. using some socks will force them to keep the body line more taut and, and yeah. do things that will allow the body to go fast because if the body's mushy, it's not, it can't go fast. It's gotta right. be like a hard shell kayak or canoe. Right. But, the, the general principle, I kind of go through these steps and el the elite swimmers are already at the top more or less, but I call it, do it right, do it faster, get stronger, and then do it longer in that right. order. Do it right, in other words, skill development, do it faster, do intervals of maintaining your form, and then you have to get stronger in order to sustain that kind of effort or speed and then kind of the last step in the whole scenario is to, to do it longer versus that traditional triangle of build your base with a lot of easy swimming and stuff and then build up to little small doses of high intensity. Yeah. Uh, so that's like kind that. of a reverse pattern that I've been using. And I think it applies to, you know, almost every within practices from the research I've learned is that when you're super tired or broken down, it's kind of almost pointless to do a bunch of skill work because your brain body connection isn't really working that well. So you kind of got to come in with some skill work at the beginning of the practice mm -hmm. and sprinkle in, you know, some intensity stuff, but try to have them carry those skills into more fatigue later in the practice or more intensity yep. or something like that. But you kind of yep. have to kick it off with, the instruction and the technique stuff at the beginning, still having some work in there. Otherwise they just space out, but you yeah. don't want to just do your work, your main set. And then, Oh, we're going to sprinkle in some technique at the end. It's mm, kind of pointless mm. at that point. Yeah. Yeah. You're, like you said, you're broken down at that point. And I, and I agree with you. I see this a lot and, and I'm not talking just about master swimmers. I go to club programs, I go to college programs. And a lot of time, the first, 20, 30 minutes, uh, they're just wasting time trying to get the body moving, warming up, right? They haven't they haven't engaged their mind and they're not doing skill work. And so they're not um, swimming with uh, proficiency, efficiency, you know, and effectiveness. They're just basically swimming up and down just to get the body moving. And yeah. uh, a lot well, of it is just doing drills and technique during yeah. that time. You get working yeah. more, just as well warmed up doing 1225s with a little purpose than a straight boring 300 where you're not thinking about anything. 100%, yeah, exactly. And, and then all of a sudden you've set a pattern that is is not what you want in your main set, whereas if you do those drills and skills, now you've set that pattern up where you can then just straight away apply that to the main set. I want to show you a couple of uh, things here, Mike, that, I, that again, I truly believe in that I've put together 
Um, I'll go full screen here so you can see it. But this is this is my short cord that I use. You talked about this this cord. I love this thing. It's got a, a nice um, soft belt on it, right? You can put the belt on here. But this thing only goes out 15 meters, so you can actually strap this to the block and then um, use this as a resistance tool to kind of get some um, speed and power work in. And, and, and it's it's fairly light, right? Like it's a it's just a it's just a, a thick stretch cord, so it'll it'll hit you pretty good. But it's not uh, it's not going to kill you. Now, if you wanted to make it harder, you could probably put on a couple of these, or you could wrap these around the block and make it. But this 15 meter cord engages very very quickly, and so I I love that for resistance work. People love you know, playing with that as well. So yeah. Um, so before you go on to the next one, let's yeah. talk about that one for a minute. Um, yeah. the, it's a really good tool, and you don't have to have a block to attach it to. You can hook it onto a lane line or something like uh, that, yep, and yep. and or or get yourself a little rope that goes hooks into your gutter and then yeah. attach it to that in the middle or on your side of the lane if you're going to split a lane. One of the problems we have with masters is you can't really operate those things with like five people in a lane, you know. Yeah. That kind of yeah. stuff. So that is definitely a challenge. So this type of equipment you got to kind of do on your own. But a lot of people have some backyard pools or some some little recreational pools they can go to that aren't 25 yards long and get some benefit. Yep. And during COVID, uh, we used to use these things a lot at people's backyard pools. And I remember some of these sets that I used to do and give, they were kick ass. I would put mm -hmm. uh, diving bricks on the bottom of the pool, mm -hmm. three bricks, one pretty close, one medium and one kind of far and give them like, all right, you're going to do 50 strokes at brick one. Mm -hmm. You're going to go up and go 20 strokes at brick two. And then you're going to go 10 strokes at brick three. And then right. float back to the wall, rest, and do it again. Yeah. Right, and change up that pattern. Maybe we're going straight to, to brick number three. And then you can only come back to brick number two. You can't totally give it up. You got to hold brick number two. You got to hold brick number two. You got to hold brick number two. And then you get to go back to three and then you get to rest, you know? And so yeah. you kind of learn these different effort levels, but you couldn't even on the easy one, totally give up your stroke because you couldn't stay over the brick. Yeah. And it's amazing how long a minute felt like to, mm -hmm. if you were trying to do that, you know, cause you're oh, getting yeah. no walls or anything. So pretty mm -hmm. much everything had to be less than a minute of total stuff. Yeah. But, you know, there's a lot of creativeness you can get with equipment like that. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a block. It doesn't have to be a long pool, but man, there's, there's some benefit you can get. Yeah, absolutely. I love my cord too. Like my cord's the only cord on the market that goes a maximum of 15. And when I say 15 meters, I'm talking about like an Olympic athlete pulling that thing. Most mm -hmm. people on my cord can only get about 10 meters. So mm -hmm. you could actually set four of these up in four corners of a 25 yard pool and oh, okay. hit each other. Yeah, so, that's that's yeah. a there's a great solution. You could make yep. it work with four people in a lane. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and point. and it engages quickly. So it's basically you got to get on on this on the pace straight away. So I, I like that. Yeah, they're fun and um and they they add value. You know, like I said, in terms of the resistance, these things really work and they get you to really engage your technique because if you if you don't engage your technique, you're not pulling that cord. You're not going anywhere. You you're not applying any speed or power to it. So it's you really find your dead spots too. If you got that dropped elbow and fingers up yep. stuff, like you're you're going backwards. You yep. gotta keep the, the pressure on and not have these big right. giant dead spots either out in front or like when you're getting your breath. If you're pausing yeah. the breath, man, you're getting shelled backwards. Right. And the other thing I love about the cord itself is it goes out 15 meters, like I said. So you can specifically work underwater work with these cords. This is where you talked about the improvement of underwaters. Now, most master swimmers aren't going to be kicking out 15 meters off each wall. But if you're practicing getting out six or seven meters on a resisted cord um, and doing repeats of that, you're only going to improve your underwater kick. You can put fins on with this thing and get a little further, get a little bit more power on it. So, um, yeah, I, lo I love it for underwater kicking as well. What's your next piece? So the next one is the is the parachute. I'm sure you've you know most people have played with this. I've got two versions. I've got I got a 20 centimeter parachute, which is kind of small, which is good. I think it's for kind of those uh, you know beginners or people that aren't super strong or maybe some older athletes. 
there's there's this smaller parachute which is is very effective catches a lot of water but it's it's doable right like kids can pull this thing older athletes can pull this one again it's got the uh it's got the uh, belt on it, which is Velcro and super comfortable. And, and then the other version I've got is a 30 centimeter parachute. So this one's the smaller version. And then I've got the 30 centimeter parachute, which is for you know bigger, stronger, uh, more competitive athletes as well. So you've you got two different versions. But there's so many different things you can do with the parachute, Mike. And obviously, this is something that you could do um, 25 repeats, 50s, even 100s. All the way up to 200s if you if you're pulling you know maybe with some fins and paddles you can do repeats of this stuff but i think again it's for that that power and that strength um but there's so many things you can do with the parachute how do you utilize the parachutes yeah so that was exactly one of the things i wanted to talk about was uh how we utilize it and i think that parachute is a great way to simulate uh a little bit of long course swimming in a short course right. pool because mm. it takes so many more strokes per lap to get across. So mm. um, you talk about front end speed and back end speed or being able to hold on to it longer. Uh, I like to think of the parachute as the back end uh, mm. and, the, and the core to be the front end. Mm -hmm. So uh, we do a little set uh, when I've got space or when I got some people's training for some sprint events uh, where we use both that and we use the socks. We're not to the power socks yet, but uh for front end speed i'll have them do it either from a push or a, for a dive with the cord dive and bang the kicks and come out and do two or three stroke cycles or five stroke cycles maybe five or six cycles if it's free and three stroke cycles if it's flyer breast and then just float back to the wall rest get out do it again you know and just carry the speed into breakout not have dead spots and all that that would be front end and then put parachute on after some easy swimming and work on back end where you push off. You don't get the resistance right away because it takes a while for the parachute to get open. You start doing your form. But, man, you're normally 13 strokes to get across. You're not even close to the other side yet. So you mm -hmm. have extra strokes in there that you have to do. And I would talk about really finishing each lap strong, whether it's just a 25 or to pull yourself into the wall strong enough because you don't get over very fast on a turn either when you're wearing a parachute you have to get closer to the yep. wall or you flip and there's no wall there mm. and then that's a nightmare too so i think the parachute kind of uh emphasizes the back end of laps and the the cord more the front end of laps mm. but mm. i like that too because you know when you talk about that and you think about it mike there's two ways you can get faster in swimming you can increase your tempo, right? Like so, you can you can increase the speed of your your kick and your arms, and that's going to increase your tempo. So the faster you spin your arms, generally with with good technique, the faster you'll go. And then the other way is the length of stroke. You know, so you talk about the parachute being that back end type speed where it's like you got to grab water at the front, you got to pull it all the way to the back. You've got to get really long on your stroke in order to pull that parachute. So, like you said, the cord could be more of that tempo you know, increasing the tempo, you know, resisting against that. And then the parachute could be that length of stroke. So yeah, I like that application of that. That's cool. Um, the next thing we have, well, the last thing that I really uh, encourage people to use, and I love the word you just use there, power socks. I, I love that. I'm, I'm going to go to that. I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to change it on my website. I'm going to call it power socks now because of Mike. Um, yeah, these, these power socks here. So these, these are actually a longer version that I've got on the market right now. Um, I'm bringing in a shorter version, so there might be a little bit easier for older athletes and kids. So it's going to be about half the, the length. These are pretty difficult, right? So um, there's two ways you can wear these these socks, these power socks. Um, you can put them under your knees, uh, a little bit less resistance because then you've got your feet exposed and you can kind of use your feet to kick, but then you've got this resistance on on your shins, you know, so it's under your knees. Also good for breaststrokers, so it doesn't interfere with the breaststroke kick as much, but it does add resistance. So I really like it under your knees for breaststroke or, it, it, you know, going a little easier. The other thing is you, the, the other way most people use it is you put it around your ankles. It drags at the back, right? Adds a ton of resistance, and it's really difficult. So you really have to engage your whole leg. You have to engage your hip, your core, in order to move this and get some – traction on your feet because this thing's um, covering your feet up and, and dragging 
Um, it's very, very difficult. So a lot of, a lot of people use these for short distances, underwater kicking again. Um, you can put fins on underneath these, right? So you can put them over your ankle and put the fins on, get a little bit more feel for the water there and use them that way. It's still, still a fairly heavy resistance on your foot, but these, these I think have really improved that, that underwater kicking for, um, a lot of programs, especially at the collegiate level, you're seeing some of the top programs and you look at NCAA times and you think, man, they're staying underwater a little bit longer. They're a lot faster, they're a lot more efficient and fluid. I think it's because these um, these power socks have come in and people are using them um, quite consistently now in programs. And and you have used these with your your masters athletes too, hey Mike? I have some, but that 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 is an ass kicker item, man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, uh, most masters kick most masters swimmers are not great kickers, right. and it's really tough to get that ankle flexibility the yeah. older you get. And if you got a bunch of triathletes who are also doing running and cycling, they're losing some ankle flexibility and stuff. So um, kicking is not as an emphasized uh, thing that we do with our program yep. because we basically get an hour to an hour 15 at most for practice. And they're only coming about three times a week. So I just can't afford to spend a 20 minute kick set, you know, mm. and they're getting almost nothing out of it. So I have to be pretty judicious about it. And I tend to get our kicking more from within drill sets and things like that. We're doing something else. Hey, by the right. way, you got to kick to get there. Mm. But a lot of our swimmers can't even break a minute for a 50 kick because their ankle flexibility is so bad. So this is definitely an advanced tool. But the trick I do like to use is, like you said, put them on, then put your fins on. And then mm. the 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 mesh goes down over much of the fin and so mm -hmm. you are getting more resistance and you can't fake it you know a lot of mm -hmm. people just anytime they hear kick at practice they're throwing the fins on and i go kicking doesn't equal fins kicking means kicking yeah. and sometimes we kick with fins sometimes we don't but don't just assume anytime you're going to do some kicking it's going to be with fins because you do need to be able to do it without but yeah. you know finding that variable amount of resistance to do uh, I, what I was doing with, uh, the swimmers that could kick decent. In other words, if they kick, kick a 50 without just a board, can they kick under 40 seconds for a 50? They could probably use the kick socks, but uh, if they're, if they're taking well over a minute to do a 50, it's kind of pointless. They're just going to drag right. their legs too much, right. but I would have them do three fifties kick with the socks uh as best they could best average and then take the socks off and do one more without and mm. see how fast they can go yeah. you know give them adequate rest to do it but man yeah. that's that's not a big set you know mm. that's a 200 a kick and you're pretty blown you know and you can do oh, yeah. it in any stroke uh, yeah well, those you, socks will catch you quick you know like you out. said that those socks hurt you know they, they drag a lot and so yeah. In order to engage your foot and your leg, you really got to work to, to move on those ones. So that's so. maybe five minutes of total time, you know, of three with mm. socks and one without or, you know, mm. in that neighborhood. But you can get a lot of value out of doing that. And, well, we tend and to lose um, like a know, rocket when you get to swim after that. Right. Yeah. You feel amazing. You know, like we, we lose mobility as we get older. A lot of us are sitting in chairs a lot, working, things like that. So we, we, we tend to get stiff and we do lose mobility. So kicking is not uh, a fun activity to do in the pool because we just don't have the same mobility. Some of us have, as we get older, we get lower back issues, things like that. So it's like, uh, it is more difficult, but the socks, at, like you said, at, at an element where you can put the fins on and get that resistance and increase a little bit of power, have a little bit of fun with it as well. Um, the other thing I've got here, Mike, is I've, I've got this um, resistance handbook. Basically, I created this book where you know people ask me all the time how do i use this equipment how do i incorporate it um i've got this waterproof book that i just put out you can put it on that's the side awesome. i like how it's laminated and it yeah. can lay flat that's nice yeah, yeah so you just it just kind of sits on the side of the pool like this lay it out and then you can just pick a workout and the good thing about the workout is you know it's progressive so you could do you got you got 20 minutes you can go through one round you got you know 30 minutes you go through another round if you've got 40 minutes or 45, you know, you can go as long as you want just by going through rounds, but it incorporates all the different um, equipment and gives you rest cycles and, you know, gives you intensity. So it kind of just walks you through it a little bit. So 
that's a bit that's a bit of fun for people that don't have a good a great coach like you or a good program is you, can, the, you can use that as well what's the scan code on there the scan code actually good good question so i actually linked that i linked that scan code to my youtube page and i've got a bunch of drills so uh -huh. like swimmers will always say what's this drill or how do i incorporate this equipment so i i put the scan code you can just use your phone and you can go to my uh youtube page and it'll, it'll show you all the the ways to use the equipment it'll show you some drills and skills so we put that on there as well and i'm always putting new stuff on there as well so it's just it's one of those things that's easy to access so yeah it's uh that, it's power, just cool. that power of youtube and scan codes and stuff is just so amazing because mm -hmm. you now you really do you have access to like the best information in the world right. on your freaking phone Right. And your phone's waterproof now. Most phones are pretty much waterproof. So you can even have it at the deck there to refer to something or watch a video of what you're trying to do yeah. and then do it, you know? Yeah. So yeah, that's your advice really cool. on that one. You know, you said people, people want to be able to just get on there and look at a certain skill or drill. And so I took your advice and put that stuff up on YouTube and um, it's going well, you know, a lot of people are looking at it and paying attention to it. So, um, but look, in terms of like resistance equipment, those are the easiest ones. I sell that stuff on my website, super easy to get. Um, but, you know, if, if you're not using it or if you if you don't know how to use it or if you're afraid to use it, just dip your toe in it, feel it out a little bit. Um, but find a great program like yourself, Mike, who, you know, coaches that will incorporate some of this stuff as well because I think it's I think it's really useful. And then the other thing I wanted to go in real quick, Mike, is the, is the recovery modalities. I think recovery is something that has really – advanced over the past you know 20 years where we're doing some really incredible things on the recovery side and this is where athletes are getting a lot smarter and we talk about you know um you know health physical health mental health improvement in mobility things like that this is where the the recovery modalities can really help master swimmers as well so you know we've always done massage therapy massage therapy is like an, an easy one i actually went and got a massage just two days ago and and I thought to myself, why don't I do this more often? You know, I felt, that one. <laughs> yeah, I felt, I felt magic. magic. Yeah. Um, the other thing that there's cryotherapy. You know, it's one of these things where you do you know ice ice tubs, or you go into like this um, freeze machine and kind of freeze your body. It takes you you know 15 minutes to go into whole body cryotherapy or ice bath. People are doing ice baths these days, so that's that's something. There's a lot more information on and. Uh, Super simple to do, even from your home. You know, just shove a bunch of ice in the bath and jump in it for 10 minutes each morning, kind of wake the body up. Um, compression therapy. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that people are using compression to get recovery in their legs, especially. Um, I mean, the the quads, the, the thighs are the biggest muscle group in the body. So, like, compressing those and getting recovery on those is something that is, has come in the last 10 years and doing a lot of stuff there. Um, active Norma recovery is a great or, or Norma Tech or yep. Hyper Ice or something like that. They yeah. have leaves that go over your legs and they do exactly. a 20 minute system, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You just, you just kind of hit it, um, at the end of practices or when you're at home or, you know, um, whatever it is, but you can, you can wear that stuff, you know, for a few hours a day as well and help you recover there. Um, the other one is just kind of an active recovery. I think a lot of times we we overlook this, but it's like just going for a light walk or going for, a, a, you know, an easy jog or just um, cycling, you know, just going for a nice bike ride or just kind of getting the blood flowing in a different way, just being active, um, some stretching, some dynamic stretching, some static stretching, you know, something that you're going to help with your mobility. Um, the big, big thing these days, Mike, I think that, has really um, come on is is the information, the quality of information around nutrition and hydration these days. You know, hydration is key um, before and during workouts and, and after as well. Nutrition, I think we're a lot smarter with how we eat, what we eat, when to eat it, that sort of stuff. It's it's um, really a lot, lot smart. Athletes are a lot smarter these days, and, and I'm seeing that across the board with even – the the masters swimmers who are really taking care of their bodies uh, on the nutrition hydration side of things and then i, I think there's still a long ways to go on that mm -hmm. front that yeah. that the jury isn't really out yet on on everything but there's definitely a lot more sports performance-based nutrition 
right. to learn. But um, I still think that's that's a real low hanging fruit that a lot of people could do more work on. Right. Uh, and it seems like people jump too heavy into certain camps of low carb or high carb or low fat or whatever. And, 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 you know, that's something that people need to do some research on, but I would say that the non-negotiable things that we kind of find with this is we find that you've got to sustain muscle mass with age. You mm. really have to find the way to keep your muscle mass and that right. requires some strength and resistance training right and it requires adequate amounts of protein yeah and and i th i would say that with the most diets around here what's easy to get or whatever if you are busy life and doing stuff is you're not meeting your approaching requirements for the day for your body weight for your ideal body weight and mm. sustain your muscle mass and so i'm trying to encourage athletes that they make sure that they get that adequate amount of protein over the course of the day, every day, because you build a deficit. You know, you might be fine on one day, but then another day you do a bunch of hard training and you right. only had 20 grams of protein for the whole day. Well, mm -hmm. you just burned away some of the muscle. And as you get older, it gets harder and harder to build muscle. You're trying to sustain it. Right. So, uh, that's and the more speed difficult. and the more speed and resistance you do, Mike, the more the more you're going to burn up calories and 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 you know the effectiveness of building some lean muscle is going to be there. But you've got to get the timing right of the protein. You got to eat it at the right time effectively, that's and you got to eat the right amount. Now, so, so yeah. So um, you know this, uh, this bringing this into somebody's program who hasn't really been doing any of this stuff. You know, you've got this booklet, which is pretty awesome, mm -hmm. but you don't just throw out the baby with the bathwater and don't do any of the stuff you used to do. You've got to start to bring in little doses of high intensity sprint yep. training and some resistance training and stuff. Mm -hmm. What would you say would be a good starting point of how how much time or sessions a week to do? You know, is it a total of 15 minutes of intensity uh, is it spread out over three, you know, five minutes at three different workouts? Can you put it all into one workout that's really committed to that? How, where do you start at and kind of what's the progression level? Do you have any comments or suggestions on that? Look, I'm always a believer in you don't really make gains by doing something once a week. So uh, I'm a kind of a, a minimum two times a week type guy, you know, so if I'm going to do something, I think a minimum of two times a week. Now, you know, there are programs around the country like like Virginia right now who the, the women have won, I think, four years in a row NCAAs. They do some speed work every day. Now, it's it's obviously um, timed right. It's it's done appropriately at the right intensities and speeds, but they're doing some speed work every day and swimming really fast. And I think we're going to see these girls at Olympic trials do some incredible things. You know, that's at the high end. So when, if you take something from that, you could say, well, yes, I can do some speed each day, but... If I'm doing it twice a week, that's going to be an effective plan to, to begin with, right? Like you said, people that have never done it before can't all of a sudden be doing it every single day. So sprinkle in twice a week. So maybe you could go uh, a, a Monday, Friday type power session where you incorporate a little bit of this, this resistance work. Again, it doesn't have to be a lot. You know, it's going to hurt you pretty good. And I think that's something that can be progressed and built upon. So, you know, if you start with 15 minutes twice a week, that's a great starting point. And then you can, you know, build up to maybe 30 minutes, you know, maybe three times a week. Um, that would be a, a great amount of, of speed work, right? And, and resistance work. My, my number, Mike, is always, you know, my, my general number that I want to get to in a workout is about 400 meters total of speed work, right? So it's that, that's a lot of speed when you add it up in terms of the pace that you're going at, at speed so 400 meters total so you might say well that could be that could be 850s all out let's say for instance right like um but that but when you add it all up around 400 meters would be the goal anything beyond that is pushing pretty hard you know it's hard to get beyond that it's going to hurt you it's going to be really difficult to recover from so you probably want to space that out a bit more mm -hmm. but i'm saying if you Anywhere between that 300 to 500, you know, that's kind of like that sweet spot I would I would aim for, you know. Cool, cool. Well, I'm really looking forward to when we get these uh, at least once a week 
maybe twice a week practices going for sprint revolution yeah. uh, where, you know, we're all coming in to train, to do a little summer league two hour meet. That's nothing but 25s, fifties and relays yeah. and uh, getting people to buy into that concept. I would overall say that, you know, masters aren't really used to going like all out kind of effort, you know? So a 25 full blast or a 50 full blast, it's like, it's a different, different thing to do that. And you don't really realize how tiring it is to actually do something yeah. at that kind of effort or speed, but it'll be fun. We're going to uh, use the equipment at the practices, require people have the stuff to come use it and learn how to use it. Right. And then they're probably going to be more likely to use it on their own. Yeah. Uh, once they kind of learned how to, how to do it right. You know, yeah. So again, we're gonna we're gonna start this league in in Southern California. And um, Mike, how can people find us and register for to join our league and have a bit of fun with us as well? So you can look up grown up swimming, uh, and and that'll put you to I think the main national page or something like that. And then they're adding teams uh, as they join up the leagues. And there's there's leagues all around the country. So there's one in Austin and a couple mm. back east and. Yep. I think they're going to open more in California and San Diego and Northern California and stuff. But yeah. the, the Orange County page is, oh, it is active. Uh, yeah. They were kind of finalizing the actual meet dates, which start in mid July, I believe. So mm -hmm. until that's exactly finalized, they're not quite uh, taking the registrations. But we do have a Sprint Revolution page in there. And maybe you can add it to the show notes or yeah. something if you yeah. do something like yeah. that. I'll that put it in cool. the show notes, yeah. And uh, and and the registration will open soon. And the cost for the league, their portion of it is somewhere around seventy five bucks for the season, and that will include all the the meets. And then teams can put a a team fee on top of that, which could cover coaching or equipment or swim practice times or any of that stuff. And we're going to add a fee on to that for our group because it will include coming to a coach practice by us, you know, and getting some supervision on, on how to do it. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're going to run some practices. We're going to run some meets. We're going to be part of the team. We're going to be racing. So if you want to be part of our racing team, certainly sign up. Uh, but if you want to just uh, partake in the grown up swim league, then we're going to put some links up here as well. But, uh, yeah, it's going to be super fun. And we've talked to the organizers and they're awesome people. And it just seems like a great way to kind of uh, bring people together. I, you know, Carrie and I, my fiance out here in in uh, Irvine, we're looking for ways to connect with people and um, just get together with a group. And and this kind of came up at the right time when we were asking that question of what what can we do to kind of connect and meet people and make friends and, and stay in the community. So yeah, we're we're super excited about it too. So we're going to try and pull in some of our friends, maybe some some former superstars to maybe join the league as well. And, have and that's it. It's going to be so cool because you're going to get you know people that are like never done a swim meet before that are mm -hmm. don't want to do a 500 or whatever. They're yeah. afraid of it. They just want to, you know. And I kind of feel like competing or doing a meet, it's like worth a month of training almost because yeah. you go yeah. through this little cycle of all the races you do, getting psyched up, warming up, getting ready, bang, going all out. You mm -hmm. learn from your mistakes and stuff. You learn a lot from it and then you can yeah. do something different next time. But we'll have those newbies that have never done it before. They're just for the first time out. And then who knows, maybe we get Jason Lezak to come out and some of 25 or some yeah. other, you know, has-beens. I'm just kidding. But guys yeah. that swim a lot that want to just come out and hang out with some old swimming buddies and throw down a few 25s or a, a, two, a 50 on a relay or something like yeah. that. Be pretty fun. Yeah, it'd be super fun. And then maybe we all get together to have uh, some orange juice after it, you know? There, so, there, there okay. is some uh, recovery drinks after these. Yeah, they, they are calling it kind of like beer league softball style swim meet. So yeah. there will be some social interaction following. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. Hey, this has been good, man. Been a learning experience for uh, for us in terms of how we can improve our master swimming. And um, there's a lot we can do, but it's it's fun. It's exciting. So, um, yeah, thanks for doing this, mate. All right. We'll look forward to seeing you on the deck and uh, us playing with those toys. I really like that idea of putting four cords, one in each corner. Yeah. 
and yeah. and doing that that sounds really fun yeah so. we can we can have a lot of fun with this thing so i think people will love it so hope to see you uh around a pool soon if you're listening to this so uh take care all right thanks mike right on <laughs>